morning we're going to conclude a study that we began a couple weeks ago entitled God's Pattern in God. And what we're talking about is the Bible. The Bible is God's pattern and guide for our lives. And in the last couple of lessons, we examined that truth from the Old Testament. This morning, we want to conclude this study by looking at how it is a guide and pattern for today. The New Testament is the law that we live under. We no longer live under the old Mosaic Covenant, sometimes referred to as the Law of Moses, the first covenant. That covenant was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2, verse 14. That covenant was given in order to lead us to Jesus Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. And once we came to where it was to lead us, it is no longer in force, it was set aside, and now men live under the law of Christ. And so that's very applicable for us today, because that's the law that we're going to be judged by. And that's the law that God gave us in order to use it as a guide and pattern in our life. So let us look for a few moments at how the New Testament is our guide and our pattern for our lives in Christ. In today's guide, it gives us a way to walk. For we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7. We walk by faith, we walk by that which is revealed. How does man gain faith? by hearing God. In Romans 10 verse 17, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When man walks by God's instruction, then he is walking by faith. Now, when we say walk, we're talking about manner of life. In the Greek, that is the meaning of the word. It means a manner of life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When man hears God, understands his instruction, and then follows it, then he is walking by faith. He is living by faith. And that is why the Bible was given to us, especially the New Testament, so we can walk by faith and not by sight. It not only gives us a way to walk, it's a way not to go beyond. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse number 6, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. And he was addressing many issues that that church had that they needed to correct that were not in accordance with God's revealed will. In verse 6, the scripture says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Men get into trouble when they go beyond that which has been revealed. When men go on beyond that which is revealed, they are guilty of sin. That is transgression, according to 2 John 9 through 11. And when we be go beyond the Word of God, when we go beyond the teaching of Christ, then we lose our fellowship with the Father and the Son. That makes it a very serious offense. And so we must learn to remain within the parameters of the instruction given to us by God through His Word. It is a way not to go beyond. We will be judged by what is written. Please take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter number 20, and here we have a picture of the judgment scene. It begins in verse number 11 of chapter 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and Him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they would judge each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, we're going to be judged by our works. Our judge, we're going to be judged by our works in accordance with the standard. What is the standard? 
The standard is the Word of God. It is the New Testament. Our works and our actions and our thoughts and the things, decisions that we made will be laid side by side by God's Word. And if they match up, then we will be blessed. But again, if they are, do not bless, are not matched up, if they do not agree, then our name will not be written in the book of life. And if our name is not written there, the text says that we will be cast into the lake of fire. And so this guide is also to remind us that it is the standard of judgment that God will use when we stand before him in judgment. In John chapter 12, Jesus made this statement himself. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The man can reject God's word. He can reject the teaching of Christ. He can reject the things that God calls upon him to do through the written word and through the spirit revealed word. He can do that. But he must understand that that comes with a consequence. There is a consequence for that. Why? Because this word is going to judge me. This word is going to be the standard by which my life will be judged and my works. And if I walk contrary to this will, if I go beyond it, if I transgress it, then I'm going to be found wanting in the day of judgment. Therefore, I need to know what this standard says in order that I might conform my life to his teaching. He gives us one way, God's way. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old path, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your soul. But they said, We will not walk in it. In the days of the Old Testament, the God's people were in apostasy. They were committing spiritual adultery. They were committing idolatry. And God referred to that as spiritual adultery. Therefore, God was going to chastise them and punish them. But he gave them time to repent. And he said all they needed to do was get back to the old path where the old good way was. What were the old paths? The old paths were the old law. The law of Moses, the instruction given by God on Mount Sinai to Moses that was written down, the codified law, they needed to go back and begin to again follow those ordinances, those commandments, and to do those things that God called upon them to do. And if they do that, then God would relent and not punish them. But you notice they said, we will not walk in it. We will not form our life around it. We will not comply with it. Therefore, they rejected God's pleading, God's long-suffering and His mercy, and really His grace. And therefore, they paid a high price because they were cast into Babylonian captivity and destroyed. Now again, we don't live under that law today, but that instruction is still good for us, that we need to look for the good way, and the good way is in the New Testament for us, and God's word that was inspired and given to men. We need to look for the road that God would have us to walk down. There is a highway shall be there, and a road it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks in the road, although a fool, shall not go astray, but the redeemed shall walk on it. If we walk down the path that God has instructed us to do, then we will be blessed and we will be redeemed. But if we reject that path and we go in another direction, then we're going to have to accept the consequences for that. And again, man is required to know what road he is on. And he is required to make sure that he is on the road that will lead him to life and not the one that will lead him to destruction. There's only one way. The New Testament also speaks of two ways. Just like the Old Testament, they were given a choice. They could go back to the old path. They could go back to the law. They could go back to the ordinances, the commandments, the statutes, and do them that they had agreed to do, that they had compelled themselves, that they would follow. If they would repent and turn back, God would 
blessed them again, but they rejected. They would not do it. Well, we have the same choice in front of us. Now, it's not the law, but it's the law of Christ. And so we must determine which of the ways that we will walk. We find this in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 13 and 14, in the great Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, toward the end of this sermon, making application to this sermon, he says, Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way, which leads to life, and there are few that find it. You see, there are two ways. There is a narrow way that is constricted, that is, that is difficult because it is a road that will lead man to life, and it is narrow because it is confined by the teachings and the instructions of God. But there also is a broad way, a broad way that will accommodate many. You can get on and you can get off, and you can accept what you want to accept and leave what you don't want to leave. And the Bible says that there are few that find the narrow way because they think it's too difficult. But the broad way, there are many that go in there at, but the consequence is that this way leads to life, this way leads to destruction. And so man's got to decide. Is he going to follow the guide that will lead him in the narrow way, that will lead him to everlasting life, or will he go in the broad way that leads him away from God, that makes him an enemy of God, and leads him in a way that leads to destruction? He has to make his choice. Every one of us has to make a choice which one of these two paths that we're going to walk down. And again, God does not force us to walk down the narrow way, and the devil can't force you to walk in the broad way. That is a decision and choice that we make for ourselves, but whatever that choice is, we must accept the consequences. And so man is in the valley of decision. He's got to decide. Ladies and gentlemen, you must decide. You must decide whether you're going to walk in the paths of righteousness, whether you're going to follow the narrow way that leads to life, or whether you're going to take the broad way that's very accommodating, that's less restrictive, that's more liberal, and gives you many more options, and you can conform it to what you like to do and desire to do, and you can do that. But there is a steep price to pay to walk the broad way. I did not say it, Jesus said it. And Jesus said the majority is going the broad way. That's not what God wants, that's not what God desires, that's what men will choose. But again, it's up to them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. We cannot get to the Father unless we go through the Son. He is the way. He is the, the access to the Father. He is the truth. All truth abides in Him. And He is the Word incarnated. And He is God's mind revealed to man. And so, if I want to have a relationship with God, I'm going to have to go the way of truth. And that's the way of life. And it goes through Jesus Christ. And there can be no other way of accessing God without going through the Son. But you can't access the Son without going down the paths of truth. That is the only way. He is the only way. I know that's narrow. I know that sounds very constrictive, and it is. But I did not say it. It did not originate with me. And so if I want to please God, and I want to have a relationship with the, the Father, then I'm going to have to come to the way and the way is given in the truth of the New Testament, and that is through Christ, and that will lead to life. That is a choice that men have and can make for themselves. John 14 and verse 6. Jesus is a way man cannot direct his own steps. We read this in Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Now, what that's saying is that we don't know how to please God without direction. We have to have direction in order to know 
what path will lead to life and what path will please God and the things that we do will be acceptable to Him. And God did not leave us without that information. He gave it to us in the Scripture. And if we don't look to the Scripture, if we don't look to the New Testament, then we're not going to be able to be sure that we're walking in the straight and narrow way. And we're not going to be able to know for sure that we're leading and walking down the path that leads to life. Again, it is a choice that man must make. Nobody can make it for you. But rest assured, you will make this choice. And whatever that choice is, you're going to have to live with the consequences. In Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is the way of death. There are many roads that seem to be right. They look right. They feel right. They're, they are good to us. We have a good feeling about that. We like going down that way. And all that may be true, but if it's not the narrow way, if it's not the one that leads to life, if it's not the truth, then it is a dangerous path to pursue. But again, you, you've got to be careful that you're going down the path that God has given in order that it will lead you to life. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 12, 15. Now, there are many people in the religious world going down many different paths. And yet, they would have you believe that all paths lead to the same end. Oh, yes, we believe in God just like you do. We believe in the Son just like you do. We worship Him just, we just worship Him differently. Yes, we believe His teaching, but we just believe it a little differently. And it really doesn't matter because all paths lead to, to back to God and lead back to heaven. Now, that sounds good. And it may feel good, but the problem is it's not biblical, because the Bible does not teach it. The Bible says that there is a narrow path. The Bible says there's only one way. The Bible says that we must walk that straight and narrow path that leads to life. And there will be few that find it. Again, open your mind, open your Bible, and read it for yourself. We need to make sure that we are walking the steps that God would have us to walk. Friend, how are you gearing your life? Is it towards heaven? Are you living according to the way that Christ has shown you? Are you walking that straight and narrow path that leads to life? Or are you walking the broad way that will lead you to destruction? You see, according to the pattern. Just like in the Old Testament when the tabernacle was built and when the temple was built, there was a pattern, there was instructions that were given and they had to be followed in order for God to be blessed and God to accept their worship. For Jesus, it's the church. We choose the path to explore it. Jesus' way or man's way. Jesus has his church. In Matthew 16, 18, he promised to build it. He's the head of it, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He's the savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. And it is that which is going to be returned back to God at the end of time, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. And we are we can choose a path to explore. It's up to you. Now the, body, the world says that you can join the church of your choice. Just choose anyone. They all lead to the same thing. They all will get you the same place. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that the Lord said he was going to build his church. And so if you want to be sure that you're walking in the straight and narrow path, you must look to the pattern of the church as it's found in the New Testament. How to be saved? The Bible is very plain about this. You must believe. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sin. You must repent of your sin. The Bible says in Acts 17, 30, At the time of ignorance, God once went that, but He commands all men everywhere to repent. You must confess Christ. Why? You must Confess Christ. With the heart man believeth on the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And many people believe that, and the majority of religions teach that. But they stop there. But the Bible says one more step. You have to be baptized into Christ. You have to put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And that's where we gain the blood of Christ. Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. And it's the blood that justifies us according to Romans 5 and verse 9. And it is spiritual circumcision that cuts away our sin 
that places us in Christ, Colossians 2, 11 through 13. That's what the New Testament says. That's the pattern of all who seek salvation. Now, it's not negotiable. It's not up to what you think or what I think. And it's not what you agree with or what I agree with. That's God's pattern. That's God's pattern for man's initial salvation, for him to enter a relationship with God, to become a Christian, to be in his family, to be part of the household of God, to be able to address God as your father. You must follow that pattern if that's what you desire. But it's a choice. You have to choose whether or not you're going to follow that instruction. God's word is an infallible God. That means it can be no error. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. When this world's on fire and everything is being destroyed, one thing's going to remain. This truth. This truth, the standard of judgment, that which we will be judged by, that which will determine whether we gain heaven or we have to spend eternity in hell. This is an infallible God. That means it's inerrant. It means it can't steer you on. It means it won't lead you to a bad place. It's going to lead you in the way that is right. Why? Because it came from God. It is inspired. It is infallible. It is inerrant. And when you follow this perfect guide, then it will lead you to where you want to go. But you have to make that decision, dear friend. You have to determine whether you're going to follow this guide and pattern in your life. You see, it's up to us. It's up to us whether or not we're going to continue to follow the pattern that God gave us. God is not going to force you. Now, I want you to listen as we try to tie all this together in the next few minutes before this our time is over. I want you to think about the things that we've talked about in the last three lessons. In the last three lessons, we have shown very vividly and plainly that through the Bible and the Old Testament and the New Testament, that God had patterns. He had God. He had instruction that he gave to his people in order how he wanted things done. Remember, we went all the way back to Noah in building the ark. He gave Noah instruction. He told him how many stories to put in, how many doors, how many windows. He told him what kind of wood to make it out of, and he told him what to put in it. He was very detailed, and we know that he, Noah found grace in the eyes of God because he followed those instructions. Later on, we see that God had a tabernacle. A tabernacle was a place of worship, and he gave instruction to Moses on Mount Sinai of how that tabernacle was to be built. Not only how it was to be built, the kind of material that it had, where the furniture would be placed in it, where the priest would offer the sacrifice, what would be done to the part that would not sacrifice, all those details. And what did God expect? God expected them to follow those details. And when they built the tabernacle and they constructed according to the pattern, then God took up symbolic uh, place worship there, and he put his spirit there, in order to demonstrate that he was in a figurative way dwelling with them because they had been obedient to the pattern. Same way with the temple. When he made a more permanent structure in Jerusalem, he gave a very detailed pattern and Solomon followed it to a T. Read it in the book of Kings when it was dedicated in 1 Kings chapter 8. God's glory overshadowed it and he took up symbolic residence because it was built according to the pattern that he gave. Now we live in New Testament times. We live under the law of Christ. And since we live under the law of Christ, he has given us a pattern in the New Testament. And in that New Testament, he's given us a pattern of his church. How it's to be organized. How it's to worship him. What work does it do? How does man get in it? What does he do when he falls back into sin? All those instructions and guidelines are given in Scripture. For the one that's outside of Christ, we looked at what the Bible says is his way to get into Christ. How does he put on Christ? How does he get into God's family? The Bible gives very explicit instruction. All man has to do is follow that instruction and he will gain what God's promised him. You see, that is God's pattern. That is God's guide for man to do the things that will please him and the things that will help him in his relationship with God. Now you go through the Bible, friend, and you open your mind and you open your Bible 
Look at the things that we've talked about. Look at the scriptures that I've put up, pointed out. And see if you do not see a pattern. See if you do not see a God. And here's what I want you to do. Was there ever a time when man rejected God's pattern, God's instruction, God's guide, and was ever blessed for that? Did things ever go well for man, whether he lived under the old law or whether he lived under the new, did it ever go well for him when he rejected the pattern, when he rejected the instruction, and when he rejected the God? When he went his own way, did it ever work for him? You know the answer to that. If you're honest, you know the Bible clearly tells you the answer to that. No, it never went well for him. As a matter of fact, it made him an enemy of God. It caused him to be destroyed under the old law, first in the Syrian captivity, then in Babylonian captivity. Now, we live under the new law. Do you think it will be any less, or do you believe that there will be a different conclusion if we reject the instruction, if we reject the God, if we reject his pattern? You know, people will tell us today that we can worship God any way we want. But if that's so, why did God give instruction how he wants to be worshipped? The church can do anything as long as it does it in the name of God. Then why did God give a pattern of what work he wanted the church to do? Ladies and gentlemen, you have to make a decision. If this book is from God, and it is, and if it's a guided pattern for our lives, and it is, and if it's infallible, and it is, and it's inspired, and it is, and it's our standard of judgment, and it is, then why would you not obey it? Why would you not believe it? Why would you not obey it? God gives you that choice. Whether you spend eternity with God or with the devil and his angels in hell depends on how you use this guide, how you use this pattern, and how you receive the instructions given therein. We would commend you to open your Bible, open your mind, and be sure, to be absolutely sure, that you're following the guide and the pattern given in his work.